I think Patrick was maybe second or third undergraduate student who came to my lab and started to work with me. And uh, he, at, even he, as this is when he was undergrad, he able to publish in uh, good places and uh, good conferences. And I can tell you, Patrick is an example for the people who are smart and hard work. Because this is very rare to find in a student. Sometimes if you see a student who is a very hard worker, he's not smart enough. Or if he's smart enough, you find he's not a hard worker. But you find one hard worker and uh, smart at the same time is very good. And he will explain to you uh, his journey until now to graduate from Cambridge. I just to give you an example. Patrick finished his Master of Science in one year. So you, you, can, you can finish MA in one year. But to finish Master of Science in one year in Computer Science, I think this is a good, great challenge for him. This is an example. And after this time, he applied for Cambridge International Scholar. And as I remember, Cambridge usually gives to 75 from the all over the world. And to, this, this means it's very competitive scholarship. And able to get one of them, I think this is a great honor for L. And again, like we're so proud of Patrick, and he will share with you his journey until now, graduated from Cambridge, and I think in next month he will start his uh, career at MIH. Right? Hello, yeah, my name is Kash McClure. Uh, I just, looking at you guys, I remember just a few years ago when I was sitting in your chair. Uh, so uh, I. Uh, did my undergrad and my master's here, as Dr. Arbaz talked about. So I did my undergrad in bioengineering and my master's degree in uh, the, computer, the CCS department. So basically, one of the things that I found when I was sitting in, sitting in classes is I said, what good is all this information? I want to know how can I use this to really do something cool. And so that led me to look for opportunities uh, in different labs around uh, UofL to try to apply some of the knowledge and see how I could be motivated to learn more about my, from my classes. Because it wasn't just saying, oh, I have to get this answer on this test, or I have to get this grade. It was actually, I want to learn this information because I want to use it to do awesome things. And so that is one of the things that um, really helped me to get sort of the, the different accomplishments that I, uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to, to get is that uh, with Dr. Obaz, I was able to build up a foundation of learning to do research, of learning how to, how to, to write papers and, and things like that. But for you, one of the things that I just want to say is that do not give up being excited about learning. So that is, to me, the key thing that, allows, that allowed me to, to succeed, is I found the areas of knowledge that I was most interested in and most enjoyed. For me, I do a lot of stuff with uh, machine learning applied to neuroscience and medical, medical, diff, uh, medical um, problems. And so just that is one thing I have to say, is when you're searching for what you're going to do next or what different things you're going to apply for, just find what makes you, what sort of knowledge makes you excited and makes you want to learn it. And like with that, I was able to, you know, work with uh, Dr. Abbas to, to get some publications when I was an undergrad. And one of the things also is don't give up. So one of the things that you think is you, you hear Dr. Abbas talk about me and say, oh, he got everything, it's super easy, you know, he just applied and got it. Like, that's not the case, and I want to tell you guys that don't be discouraged when you don't get what you apply for. So I applied every year for scholarships from since I started at UofL. I didn't get most of them. I got some of them, maybe a fifth or a sixth of the ones I applied for, I got. Uh, so for instance, uh, when I finished my undergrad, I applied for uh, the PhD I ended up doing at uh, Cambridge. 
I got into Cambridge, but didn't get funded. And so I was unable to go. And, you know, that feels discouraging, but I was able to uh, do my master's here. And then I was able to learn more, better prepare myself. And then uh, after my master's degree, I applied and got the uh, scholarship that um, Dr. Abbas was talking about. So those are the two things I just want to tell you as, as you are looking, as you are finishing up your education, as you are looking to do what's next, is find what excites you and pursue that. And then also don't give up when something doesn't work out because often if you are perseverant and try hard and just are consistent, that things, things will, good things will happen. So uh, if any of you are interested, uh, I will give you guys at the end my contact information. If you have any questions about various things regarding school or applications or anything, you can just email me and I'll do my best to, to answer you. So uh, today what I'm going to go over is I'm going to go over part of my uh, PhD thesis which focused on uh, adapting a certain machine learning uh, technique called artificial neural networks to modeling human uh, perception. So how humans perceive and through their vision understand the world. And so how many people here are familiar with what an artificial neural network is? Okay, okay. So. Let's see, so an artificial neural network, it basically has, the basic structure is that you have a, is that you have a neuron or a unit, okay? This unit is some sort of function. So often what you'll see is you'll see what's called a rectified linear function, okay? So what this says is you have some sort of threshold T. And if an input is less than that threshold, then the output of the neuron is zero. If it is greater than, you just multiply the input by one. So it's the same, so it's linear. Okay? So this is just a basic neuron. Then well, what, do you, what does this neuron do? So what we want to do is we want to take in information. So what happens is you have different inputs. These are, these are generally called weights. So you have different inputs from other neurons that are functions. And what you want to learn for this neuron is you say, Given this information, how does it affect the information that I want this neuron to output? So what you generally do is you learn these weights, which says how important is this neuron to how this other neuron should function. So in artificial neural networks, what you do is you have a lot of these, often in different sequential layers, and all you're doing is trying to figure out how each neuron should affect the other neuron by learning these connection strengths. Okay? So that, that's the basic, that's the basic uh, idea of what's going on. And so I'll try to show you a little bit. And with this idea, you should be able to sort of understand uh, what, what I'm uh, going to be talking about. So, I mean, so I like it, a lot of people ask, why is it important to model how humans behave and how uh, humans see the world? So, from a neuroscientist perspective, which is uh, where I, sort of area I did my PhD in, it's about trying to understand how humans make the conclusions they do from seeing images. From a more engineering perspective, what we do in uh, machine learning is that we are training these, say, deep neural networks to predict what labels humans give to images. So how many of you have seen the uh, videos or something on these deep neural networks that can tell you if a dog or a cat is in, a, in an image? Okay. How those are trained is that those networks see a bunch of images that people have said are either dogs or cats. So in this way, sort of even in, even in engineering, we are using human behavior as the gold standard that we're trying to match. So whether you're from a neuroscientist or a neuroscience or engineering background, sort of trying to model how humans see and how humans perceive images is, is valuable. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is representing uncertainty in these neural networks. 
So can anyone tell me what they think uncertainty is? No brave soul? Okay, okay. So uncertainty is basically your confidence in a prediction. So for instance, with the rain, you always see a weather that says, oh, it's going to rain. Well, there's also sort of a number saying how confident you are it's going to rain. And so if they say, oh, it's going to rain, but it's, we only have a 50% confidence. How is it going to change how you act? Versus if it says it's going to rain, we have a 98% confidence. So with making decisions, it is important, and that's definitely also important when you look at a, sort of a, a more B application of medical diagnostics. To say, oh, we think this person has cancer with a 50% likelihood, or we think this person has cancer with a confidence of 90%. That sort of changes how quickly, you know, how you act. And so no, no matter uh, the application, you use sort of these machine learning artificial neural network techniques, knowing uncertainty and being able to model uh, your confidence is really important. Uh, and from a more neuroscience perspective, humans are pretty good at this. Uh, so often, uh, humans in a bunch of different experiments are able to sort of understand how certain are you when you make a decision. So, so sorry, there's, there's a bit of math, um, and then we'll get to pictures. So, the goal of sort of uh, neural networks, as I said, is to learn these weights or how the different neurons should interact given some training data. So you show it a bunch of examples and you say, based off of these examples, how should the different neurons in the network interact? So what this is often, what we often want to do is we want to find the most probable weights. So what are the best weights to, to have this behavior that we want. So this is often done using a Bayes rule. So how many people know the Bayes rule? Okay. So uh, Bayes rule is a rule for combining a probabilistic information. And um, so what you're doing here is you're saying we have two pieces of information that we're wanting to, to combine together. So one is how probable the training data is given the weights. So what this is asking is how well do these weights give us the behavior that we want? And so as, as what we're trying to do is we're trying to match some, some behavior or some uh, task or do well on some task. And the second uh, term here is called the prior. So it's about what do we think, just without looking at the data, are good weights. So often what we, uh, what we use is we use a, uh, a Gaussian prior centered at zero, which basically favors small weights. So it says we want to find the weights that best predict, uh, that, lead, that best predict the training data by uh, having the smallest, uh, the smallest weights. So the values are uh, small. So this can be interpreted as the few, as the smallest interactions, as you're trying to sort of minimize the the, uh, the interactions. Oh, let's see. This is, there we go. So what we do then is we take this set of weights that we found. And that is what we use to make decisions on new, new information. So, say we're given a bunch of data of dogs and cats. We say, okay, we have found the weights that maximize the probability, that you know, are maximally probable given this, this data. Okay? Now we take those weights and we say, we give it a dog. It should classify that. We give it a cat. It should classify that. What will happen if we give it a chimpanzee? Okay? This is where uncertainty matters. Because what you want it to do is say, I have never seen anything like that before. I am extremely uncertain. <laughs> because I've never seen a chimpanzee. I have no idea what that is. Um, often, 
these sort of uh, traditional neural network techniques, don't do that. They are, they are often very uh, over, overconfident. So that's what, I'm, that's what uh, this part is going to be looking at, is how can we use methods to try and get networks that better, that better estimate their confidence and their uncertainty, so that when you show something, a chimpanzee, and it's never seen a chimpanzee, it will, it will give a prediction with low confidence. So I'm going to be talking about a, a particular method uh, called variational Bayesian neural networks. And so, let's see. So what in sort of Bayesian or Bayesian decision theory, what you want to do is you want to uh, model all information as a probability distribution, and then use those probability distributions that you've modeled to make decisions. And because the probability distributions do not have all, or usually, do not have all of the probability on one point, which is what you have if you use the point estimate that, san that standard neural networks use. They say, here is one point, whereas probability distributions say, oh, it could be several different, different points with varying a uh, probability. However, uh, this is very difficult. To, um, to compute. Uh, one reason is that you have to know the probability of your training data. So if you go and is, is, is done in machine learning things, you download a thousand cat images and a thousand dog images from Google. Uh, make sure they're copyright free, of course. And then you, you're asked, what is the likelihood that I, out of all possible images, grab these samples of dogs and these samples of cats. <laughs> what is the probability of the training data? It's the, the questions like that that make this, that make this sort, of, sort of hard. So, okay, I just need to stop clicking that button. Uh, so what you can do is you can use stuff called variational methods. Which variational methods say, we have this really complex distribution that we can't really d deal with. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and find a distribution that's close to it, but is easier to, to sample from, is easier to, to model, is either to deal with. So what happens is, is we find this by minimizing sort of this, this equation. So I'll, so let me walk through this equation, so to sort of give you an idea. What you have here, generally, in, in, uh, in pure uh, Bayesian theory, this will be the expected log likelihood uh, when you over the weights. Okay, so what this says is that is that given your probability distribution of weights, how likely is the uh, the training data? So how likely is the behavior is the behavior you want? However, it's a integral over continuous space, which is not always uh, the easiest thing to deal with. So what you do is you do something called a Monte Carlo approximation, which is you take a bunch of samples and then use those samples to approximate what your expectation is. And through the, the law of large numbers and uh, the more samples you take, generally the closer the approximation. Uh, because machine learning often wants to be fast and efficient computationally, uh, what's often done in machine learning is you just take one sample. So that gives you really noisy estimates, but in practice it, it works pretty well. So the second term is called the KL divergence. So what that is, is that is a divergence which is similar to a distance. Uh, so you're saying how similar are, are these two things. So this is saying we want our model distribution to be as close to our prior as possible. So in, uh, as often done, your prior is saying we want these weights to be small. So that's what you're trying to do. You're saying we're trying to keep the probability of small weights high while also trying to get the behavior that we, that we want. And so we use this to try and learn the uh, variational distribution that we want. However, as some of you may say, what in the world is a variational distribution? What does it look like? What's going on? Uh, so. Uh, oh, excuse me, let me, before I get to that. Uh, and then at, uh, when you want to predict something, 
what you do is instead of using the point estimate of the weights like we did on the previous slide, you can do a, again, a Monte Carlo estimate of your, of your predicted probability. Okay, so how many people are completely lost? I, I'll, I'll ask that. I, a little lost is, may happen, but completely lost? Okay, okay, no brave souls today. Uh, so what we can look at is we can say, well, what are these variational distributions? Generally, as I said, they're generally simple distributions that we want to use because they're easy to deal with. So again, what we'll have is we'll have some sort of baseline, just no standard neural network, which is, as I showed you, is a bunch of neurons connected, connected together. And those connection values are what we're learning. Again, so we're trying to learn how, in, in this case, how this neuron's value should affect these neuron's values, how this neuron's value should affect these, and so on. And if you stack these together, then you're learning sequentially that. And so that's where you would get the terminology of like something that's called a deep neural network, is where you stack a lot of these together and have a uh, series of sequential steps. Okay, so what we do is we use, um, in this work, we use two standard uh, distributions. One's called the Bernoulli distribution. If you've, any of you have taken the uh, statistics course here, you are very familiar with that. It's basically saying, basically you can think of it as a coin flip. Um, for some probability, you flip a coin. Sometimes it will be one value, one. Sometimes, in this case, one. Sometimes, with another probability, it will be zero. And the probability of it being one and zero those two probabilities have to add up to one. So you only have two possible uh, states, basically, and there is a probability of being in each. Then the Gaussian is a normal distribution. I'm sorry, if you do not know what a normal distribution is, I cannot help you today. <laughs> um, it is just the classic bell curve that you've seen since middle school. Uh, that, and so you have some sort of central mean value that is the most likely, and then as you get further and further away, you sort of tail off. And so what you can do is you can do different uh, sampling, thing, sampling methods with these variational distributions. So one, you can do, you can sample connections. So let's say that we have a uh, Bernoulli sampling for each one of those weights. What that says is that for some probability, a connection is going to be set to zero. And for one minus that probability, it will be whatever learned weight we, we, we have. Um, so if any of you are interested in the machine learning literature, this is called uh, Bernoulli Drop Connect. So that's sort of its uh, machine learning uh, name. But in, in reality, you're just flipping, basically flipping a coin for each, each uh, connection when you run a network and say this is going to be on or off. Okay? The thing is you can also do that for, for units. So you can say for each unit in the network, when we, when we run it, flip a coin. Is it on or off? And then, of course, what you can also do is you can do Gaussian. So you can say each time we, we run the network, each weight will have a value that is drawn from some Gaussian distribution centered at the most likely value. And then, again, what you can do is, you probably guessed it, you can do Gaussian sampling of, of the units. Uh, what you can also do is you can do interesting combinations of these. So one interesting combination that uh, you can see in the literature is a uh, spiking slab, which is you have a bunch of probability at zero, and then you have some sort of Gaussian, like that. So it's either going to be a zero, or it's going to be drawn from this Gaussian distribution. So that's, that's called spike and slab. And so uh, we, we, we uh, in this work, we use spike and slab dropout, which is where a unit is either on or off. If it is off, it's zero. If it's on, uh, the, it receives um, inputs from weight, from connections drawn from some Gaussian distribution. So one of the things you may ask is, well, if we're sampling units, how in the world are we drawn from a probability distribution of weights? 
Uh, and so what we're going to be looking at is that all of these sort of fall in sort of this framework where you have the weights you're sampling, W, you have the parameters, the variational parameters you're learning, V, and then you have M. So what M is, it's a noise mask. So it's some uh, values that we sample from some distribution. So in this case, we'll sample it from uh, Bernoulli or Gaussian, or both. So what happens is, is that for the drop connect methods, or the connection sampling, what you do is for each connection independently, you sample a, a random mask value. For the dropout methods, it is for all, uh, say, incoming connections. And then spike and slab, it's a combination of both. Does, that, does this picture sort of help a little bit? Okay. So then we have another picture that, that maybe show. So, well, what in the world does this, all this math do? So here's sort of an illustrated example of what this leads to when you actually use it. So what we have here is we have a random values that are uh, drawn from two uh, two-dimensional two Gaussians. And then we're asking is we want to find the line that best allows us to say if a point belongs to the blue pluses or the green dots. So what we can do is you can use a method called logistic regression. Um, yeah, so what that does is that says learn the weights that goes to a neuron and that neuron will give us the probability of a point being on what's uh, one side or the other side of a, of a line. In that case, the line that you're trying to learn is the best line for telling the difference between the two. So what happens is, is for the standard, the baseline that we talked about before, you have this one flat line. Okay? <clears throat> what you can do is with um, these sampling methods is as often in the machine learning literature you only sample during training and then uh, when you actually want to predict something to save speed, to save computational time, you just take the, uh, the, the basically expected values of each, of each layer. Uh, so that's what in these plots is the blue line. So what we can see is that if you sample, you get this uncertainty information that's not there when you take, when you take the uh, expectation, the layer-wise expectation. So for instance, here we see that as you go away from the two distributions, what happens to, to the lines that are sampled? Do they agree more or disagree more? They disagree more. So that means that the difference in their predictions is larger. So that gives you a measure of how certain you are. Because if all these lines agree, like here, that says, oh, I have seen a lot of information here. I can make good predictions. But if you're over here, yeah, you know, oh, I, I haven't seen anything here. So this is our chimpanzee, and we have our dogs and our cats. Okay? Um, and as you can see, that very uh, different methods uh, have different amounts of uh, the spread as you get away from the data. Um, one of the things to sort of note is that, um, in this case, unit sampling uh, has a lot less um, sort of spread than uh, connection sampling. But if you combine, combine both, uh, you solve the effect. It's crazy, but that's what you want. You basically want to say, where in space am I crazy to make predictions? Um, which is something you don't have if you just have one line. Okay, so what we do is we, uh, so how much time do I have? Okay, cool. So I'm not stressed out. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to ask with how does sampling affect the performance of these, these networks or the performance of these models? So what we want to do is we look at uh, three different measures. One's accuracy. So that says, how well do I do the task that I'm trained for? Okay, I said, how well do I, can I tell the difference between dogs and cats? The other is uncertainty. 
saying, am I uncertain when I am far away from the data I've seen? The other is calibration. So what calibration looks at is not only are you uncertain, but you're correctly uncertain. So, for instance, if a weather person says it's going to rain with 70% chance, okay, a correct calibration prediction would be that 70% of the time, when they predict 70%, they're right. So it means that that, that sort of confidence is meaningful, that you can trust it. And so that's what we check with calibration, is how can we trust the uncertainty estimates? Yeah, you may be getting more uncertain, but can we trust the values you give us? So basically what we have is, again, we have the two colors. We have learning only, which is the layer-wise expectation, which is often done in machine learning. And then we have the sampling during learning and inference, which is uh, the, the variational Bayesian methods. And then what we have is we have our little network. And we have our input images. So what we did to test what happens when you get further and further away from your training data is we just added more and more uh, Gaussian noise. So this is the standard deviation of a Gaussian that we add to the input images. So the uh, task that we're using here is something called MNIST, which is just handwritten digit recognition. So you have 0 through 9, and you say, given this handwritten digit, what number is it? And so we have those, and then we have those of increasing noise added. And so the noise is basically saying, on average, you are, you are moving in an increasing distance in a random direction. And you're saying, how does that, how do all these networks deal with that? So what we then do, yeah, and this is, this is the particular uh, standard deviation we use for this plot. But, um, so then what we can do is we have a calibration plot. Which we say is the model predicted probability. So this is the confidence that the model gives. And on the y-axis, we have the frequency. So I said, if a weather person says they, are, they have 70% confidence, they should be right 70% of the time. So what that leads us to do is we say what we want to do is we want to be on this line. We want our predicted probability to match the frequency we see. So what we have here is we have overconfidence, where the model predicts something with a higher confidence than it should have. And we have underconfidence, which is where you know the opposite. So then what we can do is we can look at how these methods deal with this. So what we can see is that the standard machine learning approach of just sampling during um, learning give us models that are underconfident at low, low probability predictions and uh, overconfident at uh, higher. Uh, you, you see a little bit of that with the, um, with the variation methods, but the magnitude is a, lot, is a lot less. So that's, that, so I'm, I have a ton of um, slides that will go over a bunch of different examples of this. And we'll, I'll go over probably just one of them uh, to sort of give, one or two of them, to give you sort of an idea of, of what's going on with these methods. Um, let's see. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I hear the laugh. Um, so what happens is these are for Safar 10. So what Safar 10 is, is it is a 10 object recognition problem. So you see a natural image. And you're saying, what of 10 certain objects is it? So you have dogs, you have cats, you have frogs, you have airplanes, you have trucks, you have automobiles. And so what we have here is we're saying, given this, well, you know, what are the effects? So what we have is on the x-axis here of each of these plots is the standard deviation of the noise that we're adding to the image. So this is basically how far are we getting away from our training examples? Because that's what we're asking, is we want networks that as they get away from the training data, they're uncertain. Okay. So what we have is we have the classification error, which is telling us how many mistakes do we make. We have the entropy. So what the entropy is, it, it's saying when you predict across these 10 different uh, classes, how distributed is your probability? So you're more uncertain if you say, oh, I'm 10% confident in each one of them. 
then, oh, I'm 90% confident in one. Because that means that you have 0.1 probability to spread out all nine. So this looks is this uh, entropy looks at how spread out is your is your probability. So okay, what we see is with the classification error, it or this is for convolutional neural networks. So it's a particular type of neural network. If you have questions about it, you can ask me after after the lecture, and I'll do my best to, best to explain. Um, but so what you have is you have the the uh, classification error. So as expected. Um, as you go further and further away from all the examples you've seen, you make more mistakes. That's, that's reasonable. Uh, what is interesting to say is that when you have uh, unit sampling in these convolutional neural networks, you actually start out at a better accuracy than if you do, if you do weight samples. So that's one advantage that we, that we can look at, is say, okay, they have better accuracy near the training data. However, as you can see, they're a lot less robust, which means they fail a lot quicker when you get away from the training data than the uh, connection or weight sampling. Okay. The other thing that we want is that we want to see that uh, you, know, you become more uncertain. And that's definitely true for the two, for the two um, uh, me, yeah, weight sampling methods. But what you can see is that if you just take the layer-wise expectation, it increases a little, but it's mostly flat. Whereas if you do the sampling method, you, you, uh, there's definitely an effect. Uh, and then what you see here is that for the uh, sampling methods, you, ge you generally get a little increase with a, maybe a slight dip at the end. But for the, um, uh, for the uh, normal layer-wise expectation, you get slight, uh, you get slightly worse, but still, still okay. Where you really see a difference in the in the um, uncertainty estimates of the unit sampling ones is when you look at calibration. So this is saying I just don't want to say, oh, I'm not confident all the time as I get further away. I want to correctly place my confidence. And so what this is, is this is a sort of calibration MSC. So it's how far away from that x equals y line that the calibration plot is. And so as we can see from, weight, from this weight sampling, these are very, very uh, good at knowing their confidence away from the data. Ha uh, however, they have less accuracy near the data. And then these are the two uh, only unit sampling ones. They fail, their calibration fails a, a lot quicker. So what you can do is if you combine them with the spike and slab, is you can actually have um, good starting accuracy near the data. And you can also have better um, uncertainty estimates away from the data. So you can see that this line is a lot, is a lot lower than that. Um, and what you can also look at to sort of understand the uncertainty is you can look at the calibration plots. Where you can really see how, fit, how the different methods fit, the data, fit near the data. So the weight, the uh, weight sampling only, that, uh, you know, is the sampling definitely helps. But for the, um, all of the methods that use unit sampling, you fit the data really well. In that close to the data, you have very good uncertainty estimates. However, as you get further and further away, these methods fail. Uh, whereas the weight sampling, while they do get much worse, are so much better than, than these. Um, however, again, if you combine the unit sampling with the weight sampling, you can pull up the, uh, the calibration. Uh, that's especially visible here in sort of the mid-range of the noise where these are much more failing than this. So one of the other things that, um, that these sampling methods are really good for is that often in machine learning, one of the biggest pains is hyperparameter optimization. It, these are values that are not learned given, that are often not learned given the training data, but are, in, are excuse me, directly from the training data. Often you have to do some sort of meta-learning where let's say you have some sort of held out validation set of data 
and you say, given all these values, how do I do on this validation set? And then use that to use that to set those values. Um, and often you, the question is like, how fine grain do I have to go? How do I change these? It's a little bit of a black magic sort of way, uh, sort of hard thing. But one of the things that you can see is that for um, the unit sampling methods, um, the when you sample, you have a lot more robustness robustness to these hyperparameters. So you don't have to be so you don't have to be as finicky and as 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 worried. Um, that's not a main thing, but it, it is it is nice. So well, basically, well, basically, well, you know, what I wanted to show is that through this stuff is that when you sample both during learning and inference per the variational methods, you these networks model their uncertainty better. So you can trust their predictions more than with the with the standard uh, neural networks, at least at, by confidence. And then this is what I said is that sampling units led to CNNs with uh, higher accuracy and uh, and then weights led to CNNs with better uncertainty estimates. And then if you combine them, you can get sort of a compromise where you get where you get um, you know good accuracies while also getting better uh, uncertainty estimates. Okay. So uh, I still think I have a little bit of time, so I'll I'll try try and get to this. So the one of the questions I started out with is saying we want to model visual perception. <laughs> And I just showed you a bunch of graphs that say, oh, you do this, you do this, you do this, you get this effect. Uh, and so this uh, part of the talk is where I try and take this and bring it back to our first question about how does this help us to build better computer vision models and to better predict uh, human behavior through, through vision. And yeah, so this is, this is a little more neuroscience-y, so I will... Just I just basically give you gave you the give you the the intro basically. So what we're gonna have is what we're gonna use here is we're gonna use the approximate Bayesian methods, the variational methods that we talked about, and we're gonna use Gaussian uh, unit noise. So the reason we do this is the Gaussian unit noise is the method that had the highest accuracy near the data, and it is the one that is easiest to train. And so for this one, what we do is we use a a, a data set called I ImageNet which is 1.2, 1.3 million images of a thousand categories. Uh, so th this can be somewhat difficult to, uh, to train. So what we also did is we used the uh, Gaussian, um, uh, Gaussian uh, unit noise. Uh, yes, this says weight noise because um, with a particular thing that I was trying to get at here is that you can interpret unit noise as uh, correlated weight noise. Um, so what we have is again, we have these various things. Uh, so yeah, ImageNet is a thousand categories. Um, then what we have is um, there's this thing called an EcoSet, which basically builds a data set that has uh, 562 classes, but they're classes more along the lines of what humans and hu uh, humans would, uh, would be used to predicting, because we want to see how well we model human behavior. So for instance, man is not a class in ImageNet. Okay? But there are 130 or 128 species of dogs. So what happens is if you take this ImageNet model and say on a smaller 16 category thing, give me predictions, and one of these categories happens to be dog, this ImageNet model, because it has been trained to predict dog for a huge amount of this data, is very biased towards dog. So what we can look at is we can say, okay, what we have is we want to see how does this sampling affect accuracy. So for this, for these large models, we see that it actually that it actually helps. So there's a significant increase in accuracy when you first there's an increase in accuracy when you sample during learning, but use the layer-wise expectation at uh, making predictions. However, if you sample up both, you get another significant increase in, in accuracy. So what we can look here is this is looking at what happens when you make the distribution you're sampling from more variable. So that's what this, this p-value is. So what happens is, is that at point 0.2, both of, for, for the ecoset, 
both of the both the uh, layerwise expectation and the sampling and prediction methods both work. However, when you up the uh, the variance of your your distributions, the layerwise expectation, which is the common one used in machine learning, uh, fails, while the um, sampling during prediction still still works. And we did this because we wanted to see what is the effect at these two different points in this hyperparameter space on predicting human behavior. We want to see, well, does making something, does a more variable model, you know, do better? So what we have is we have our trusty plots. So these are just like we talked about, where I went over before, these are the calibration plots. And so they're just a little more colorful because we have a lot more uh, things to go over. So on the left, what we have is we have the the blue line is what happens when you use the layerwise expectation. So that's where you sample during learning, but then just take take uh, your rest value uh, at prediction. The red is where you sample both, and then the green is where you you don't sample at all. So what you see is that not sampling at all gives you uh, overconfident predictions. Uh, that that is often related to something called overfitting, where you just fit the train data too much because uh, yeah you don't regularize. But if you don't understand those terms, uh, don't don't worry. Then the blue is extremely underconfident, whereas the, the sampling method is very very close to what what we think is the ideal. Um, and then that's not only true for ImageNet, but it's also true for this EcoSet, which is the set of images that have more human-like, uh, are, are the classes in the ecoset are more like humans would see and humans would predict. So then what we do here to compare to human, to human behavior, is we use something called a confusion matrix. Okay? So we have these different, 16 different, different classes. And for humans, we have them look at these images, or someone else did, but we use a data set, where people looked at images quickly and had to classify which, which of these 16 classes an image was. And then what happens is, is when you do it, if you, make the, if you make it a little challenging, people make mistakes. And so it tells us which sort of classes, if you show them a bunch of images, which classes human, humans tend to mix up. Is something wrong? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so what happens is is for this sort of entry level or these these sort of sixteen classes, we do uh, we didn't see a difference between both of the both the uh, sampling and doing learning and the sampling during learning and inference uh, at the point two, or the um, sampling during learning and inference at point three. Uh, but those were a lot better than the um, sampling only at learning at point three. But that is as expected since that's where it failed, where the standard, just like we saw in the in the previous section, failed. And then the no MC, these are significantly better than that as well. However, what is, oh yeah, and then what we can also look at is our calibration plot. So we see that even though the blue line is the line that has the same, is not significantly more accurate than the sampling lines, but the sampling lines predict their uncertainty and, their, and have better confidence estimates than both, yeah, both the other methods. So then, that's good, but again, how does it deal with, with human behavior? So these uh, may be a little hard to see, but these are the different matrices, uh, confusion matrices for humans and the different methods. And what we did is we found the rank correlation between the off ad. So we said, how well do the mistakes of a network predict the mistakes of the humans? Okay. And then we, uh, we compared those, and so sort of what we saw is that 
the sampling methods, even though they were not more accurate, better represented the mistakes that humans would make. So uh, this is, uh, you know, sort of a what we saw as a step towards uh, trying to have models that model human behavior better. Um, because not only do they model their uncertainty better, and humans are generally in many, many different tasks good at modeling their uncertainty, but they also uh, predict their um, the mistakes better. The exact interaction between these two twos is, is unknown. But uh, that's something that we are going to further, further explore. Um, what you do, you can also do, is you can uh, test these networks on grayscale images. So it was trained on color images. And you can say, well, what happens if we do grayscale images? And what you see is you see very similar results um, to when you have color. So this says that these, that these sort of behaviors are somewhat robust to, to, uh, to, to, to minor changes in the uh, data space that you either are testing on or training on. So yeah, and so it's basically that when you do these variational methods, not only do you improve things that machine learning people care about, so especially in large scale networks on these large scale tasks, you increase accuracy, you increase, you have better uncertainty estimates, but you also then tend to predict uh, human mistakes better. So thank you very much for listening to me uh, talk for so long. Uh, do you guys have any questions either about the material or about um, like what I did at Louisville or whatever? I'm pretty open. Yes. Have you thought about a way maybe to, I don't know, just if you've thought about uh, or worked on it at all, somehow using that accuracy from one and the, the predictive ability of the other and kind of combining those to make a more accurate and oh. better. What do, you, what do you mean I don't? Well, you were saying that the, the ones that predicted better had lower accuracies. Yeah, so that, that was what the spiking slot dropout was. Is it was looking at the ones that had better uncertainty estimates were the weight sampling. Mm -hmm. The ones that were more accurate were the unit sampling. Mm -hmm. So Spiken's lab does unit binomial sampling and Gaussian weight sampling. And then it is a compromise, so it has good, good accuracy as well as good uncertainty. So yeah, we, that's, that was what we did to look at combining them. Right. If that answers your question. Right, but it still had lower accuracy than, um, than the learning model, than originally, right? Then uh, when you combine them, it still had a lower even. Okay, so yeah, so it, it it had sim it has similar accuracy to Bernoulli unit sampling, mm -hmm. which is what it's using. But it did does have lower uh, accuracy than Gaussian, right. um, which uh, will have the, the Gaussian stuff works. Is it fits the data very well, but away from the data, it's it's, it's not not as good. Yeah. So I, I guess I was thinking it's sort of like a way to do them, like to have it uh, look at the images separately and then. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's basically like you use both methods separately, and then after that you use the accuracy of one and the predictability of the other. Well, the, what's hard the is predictions. that you, we, they each give you predictions. What you actually want to know is how confident I am in these predictions. So if you get the confidence of one and the prediction of another, those things don't match. Because you're saying, you're saying how confident am I in my predictions, so you say, oh, I'm 70% confidence that's going to rain. And then you say, oh, I'm going to slap 70% confidence on it's not going to rain. Because this other model says it's not going to rain. So you just can't, you just can't copy in like that, unfortunately. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Yes? Uh, first, thank you for being assist bio and biosystems class. Now I maybe won't think transfer functions are as intimidating. <laughs> uh, just for more generally, overall, a lot of the students, like, may have to take a survey. So most of the people here are P430. Uh -huh. They're going to do after they graduate, and I think 60% of them say they want to do the bioengineering master's degree. Um, so just can you give a talk on maybe your experience here as a master's student, the value of maybe a thesis versus a non-thesis track? Sure, sure, sure. Um, unfortunately, I did not do a BE master's. Right, I understand, but it's still a Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so well, one of the things is, uh, what I can specifically talk about is a project for this thesis. So that's something I, I, can, I can definitely talk about. Um, so. 
I think a thesis is, is really important because what it is, is the thesis is a way of training yourself to think somewhat independently about a challenging problem. So what it is doing is it's training you to use all of the knowledge that you've gained in your undergrad as a foundation and then learning how to extend that a little bit on your own but also with the help of your, your supervisor into a new area and sort of seeing how can I take various different pieces of information and with my own intuition and hard work sort of build something new. And that sort of experience is very good because no matter what job you have, you're going to be wanting to take old information, combine it in novel ways, and apply it to some complex, com complex problem. Uh, yeah, and so it all. Yeah, it, there's a bunch of other benefits, uh, such as it's often it's often looked uh, good. It often looks really good on a on a resume that you have a thesis. Um, there are various other things, but uh, sort of the educational value I think is is very high, as well as sort of just yeah getting the personal experience of sort of tackling something pretty close to on your own and sort of accomplishing that. Uh, is, good. is really good. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, as long as they're happy. If you have any questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so please, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm open, and I'll be open for a little bit after to answer your questions. Yeah. So my question was, once you have an image and you give it to the program, <laughs> how does it relate to the neuron? Like, what does the neuron receive? Does it receive all the pixels for the image? Okay, so um, generally what, hap what happens is, uh, it, okay, so for a fully connected network, uh, what generally happens is you have some image and then you have some sort of set of neurons. So what happens is, is you have a connection from each pixel to each one of these neurons. And so what these first neurons get is some sort of the input, is some sort of linear combination of the, the uh, pixels of the image. Then of course what you do is you do your nonlinearity function and then for deep neural networks, uh, the next layer will not receive these pixel values. Instead, it will receive a linear combination of these nonlinear functions. So you do start out by having basically a weighted combination of, uh, of the pixels of the image. So the neurons, the whole network is able to look at the picture as a whole later on? Okay, so that is, where, um, that is where the sort of convolutional neural networks come in. And what convolutional neural networks do is they have increasing receptive field. So receptive field is basically the amount of an image that you look at. So in convolutional neural networks, the early layers have small receptive fields. And as you get deeper and deeper in the network, the, the a neuron deeper has, um, it basically has a larger receptive field. And that is often accomplished by, uh, by pooling. Um, if you want to learn more about these neural networks and exactly all this stuff, I can give you some great online resources that um, are really easy to watch and easy to understand, um, basically YouTube lectures. And this will give you much more insight into these sort of more technical questions that will be very difficult for me to give satisfactory answers in, in five minutes. Hey, Colin. I'm surprised that you didn't mention that we have one of the best experts in the domain of neural networks and one of the first books, yes, Dr. Yes, Zorada. Yes. So yes, I would really, it is not necessary to go oh, no, not totally right. outside our school. Yes, definitely, definitely. So um, he even had, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has, he has some resources if you're really interested in neural networks. Um, you can potentially talk to him more. Or, yeah. So, cool. It, as I said, if, if it, any more questions, I'm happy to, to, to answer them until, until, until you guys are, the bell rings and you guys are saying, let me out, thank you very much, you know, the class is done. No? Cool, well, thank you very much. For